I know, I know, another Jordan Peterson video. I'm sure you know who he is, the world's current best-selling intellectual dark web megastar self-help guru, and I'm sure you've heard the criticisms, lobsters, feminism, postmodern neo-Marxism. And yes, we're already inundated with critiques, especially here on YouTube. But today, I want to look at something that I think has both been overlooked and is central to Jordan Peterson's and the wider self-help genre's philosophy, individual responsibility. Almost all of Peterson's arguments revolve around this idea of individual or personal responsibility. You could say it's the meta-foundation at the core of his philosophy. Today, I'm going to look at what individual responsibility really means, how we can understand it philosophically, and why it has its limits. The argument I'll draw out is this, that Peterson emphasises individual responsibility to an unreasonable degree, while discounting the necessity and power of social or collective responsibility, that each individual and social are two sides of the same coin. But before we start, I will say this. 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order are both great books. I learnt a lot. There's a lot of insight, many ideas to agree with, and much to disagree with too. I like the psychologization of the biblical stories. There's a great chapter on telling the truth, another one on assuming the person you're listening to might know something that you don't. And I also think he often gets unfairly caricatured, but he, in his turn, repeatedly strawmans and oversimplifies his opponent's arguments, usually leftists and postmodernists, in a way that I think, frankly, is irresponsible. But taking a thorough look at the idea of individual responsibility helps us to understand why he almost has to do this, because of what he's leaving out. So first, what does Peterson mean by individual responsibility? Both 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order and Peterson's wider lectures have individual responsibility at their core. The books are replete with phrases like, you must take responsibility for your own life, period. Each individual has ultimate responsibility to bear, and we must each adopt as much responsibility as possible for individual life, society, and the world. And this lecture, and others like it, talk of the sovereign individual. Now, first, what follows isn't an attack on individual responsibility per se. The concept is fundamentally important, timeless, powerful, has been historically fought for, and Peterson has a lot of well-articulated, useful insight on how to take responsibility that people clearly want to hear. But what I want to focus on is what's left out. It's safe to say that Peterson is a type of individualist. He focuses a lot on the archetype of the hero's journey, for example, of personal sacrifice, of focusing on oneself. Conversely, he's sceptical, to say the least, of any collectivist or socialist ideologies, and ideology more broadly. As he says here, it's the enemy of the idea of the individual, the sovereign individual, which is the central idea of the West. I mean, and that's manifested in the underlying religious structure. What category is to be primary? And for me, the individual is to be primary. And there's a variety of reasons for that. First of all, the individual is the locus of suffering and also the locus of responsibility. So, so those are really the two reasons. This is illustrated more clearly in Book 1, Rule 6. Set yourself in perfect order before you criticise the world. He writes in it, 
Consider your circumstances. Start small. Have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Are you working hard on your career or even your job? Or are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? Have you made peace with your brother? Are you treating your spouse and your children with dignity and respect? Do you have habits that are destroying your health and well-being? Are you truly shouldering your responsibilities? Have you said what you need to say to your friends and family members? Are there things you could do that you know you could do that would make things better around you? Have you cleaned up your life? Now, to understand why this core foundation is one-sided, we need to see what the other side of the coin is. We need to ask a really simple question. What does individual responsibility mean? Throughout history, philosophers have interpreted responsibility in several ways. The concept has been discussed most frequently in philosophical debates about free will. First, though, let's take it apart. Response, ability. Etymologically, the root of responsibility is to be able to respond to some thing, to react to a set of circumstances. But it's often used as a value judgment, too. One person might judge whether another was able to respond in a positive, helpful, useful or moral way. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy puts it like this. The judgment that a person is morally responsible for her behaviour involves, at least to a first approximation, attributing certain powers and capacities to that person and viewing her behaviour as arising in the right way from the fact that the person has and has exercised these powers and capacities. So we have several key concepts here. Judgment, behaviour, power, capacities. Let's look at an example. Shoplifting, say. We might judge that it's immoral behaviour and the person had the capacity to know it was wrong and had the power not to do it. Consequently, we might hold them morally responsible. But what if we found out that the person had dementia? We might say that they didn't have the capacity or the power to remember right from wrong or to remember where they were. Does this diminish their responsibility? Is this a mitigating circumstance? It seems, to me anyway, that we judge them less morally responsible for the shoplifting than we would someone stealing jewellery, for example, because they wanted to be rich. But if we find out the person has dementia, we might say that they didn't have the capacity to know right from wrong and not find them morally responsible. And this is if we were judging them ourselves or as a jury, say. And this is where free will comes in. Many, like the existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, have argued that to be responsible for something, to be held accountable, you would have to have the freedom to have done otherwise, to have chosen more morally. That is, you have to be the cause of the action, inaction or belief, not the dementia, say. So let's take another example. A 16-year-old who assaults someone, if we're on a jury, our initial inclination might be to hold them responsible as the cause, to blame them, to hold them accountable. But imagine certain facts are slowly revealed to us. They came from a bad home, a poor neighbourhood, the person had been bullying them or taunting them or even stealing from them. What if we find out the person was being blackmailed? We might still hold them responsible but maybe less so. Mitigating factors, causes from outside the person, might lead us to sympathise with them in some way. Let's take one more example. The same child failing a maths test. Were they responsible? Did they cause the failure? Of course, it depends on the context. They might not have studied enough, sure, but they might have a teacher who has treated them unfairly. They might not be able to afford the books. They might have a home life that doesn't encourage homework. They might have a learning difficulty. Now, let's look at a quote from Book 1, Rule 3, 
where Peterson tends to discount contextual factors in favour of individual ones. He says, People create their worlds with the tools they have directly at hand. Faulty tools produce faulty results. Repeated use of the same faulty tools produces the same faulty results. It's in this manner that those who fail to learn from the past doom themselves to repeat it. It's partly fate. It's partly inability. It's partly unwillingness to learn, refusal to learn, motivated refusal to learn. This is the central question asked by many philosophers of free will and responsibility. If we're a product of our context, of our environment or our circumstances, our upbringing and education, or even our genes, are we ever truly, ultimately responsible for anything? This position is called determinism. And it attempts often to understand human behaviour in a scientific way. As the psychologist B.F. Skinner wrote, if we're to use the methods of science in the field of human affairs, we must assume that behaviour is lawful and determined. We must expect to discover that what a man does is the result of specifiable conditions and that once these conditions have been discovered, we can anticipate and to some extent determine his actions. Skinner framed the problem of responsibility in the specifically modern and scientific context. That science tells us that the entire universe is determined and that everything has a cause. Why should human behaviour be any different? He continues, A small part of the universe is contained within the skin of each of us. There is no reason why it should have any special physical status because it lies within this boundary. And eventually we should have a complete account of it from anatomy to physiology. If determinism is true, if everything is caused, then this poses a problem for the idea of individual responsibility because we're not really responsible for anything we do. But surely the idea is meaningful in some way. Does this picture not leave something out? The influential American philosopher Roderick Chisholm uses this example. Take a flood destroying a dam. We might ask the following. What caused the dam to give? Poor construction, political corruption maybe, cutting corners, or was it constructed to the best of the builder's abilities but the rainfall was simply unprecedented in a way no one could have predicted? Maybe wrong materials were supplied by accident, maybe on purpose, again to cut corners, maybe someone sabotaged the dam, maybe a river was redirected, maybe it was global warming. The question is where is the cause? Where? does responsibility lie? We can see here that causation and responsibility are identical to one another. Aristotle put it like this, a staff moves a stone and is moved by a hand which is moved by a man. Do we hold the staff responsible for moving the stone or the hand? Maybe the muscles, the neurons, maybe the man. Maybe he was ordered to move the stone by a despot. Maybe moving the stone was a byproduct of another intention, like simply standing up. The point is this. When we look closely, we often don't locate a single point of causation. Find a single ultimate factor that we hold responsible. There are, of course, many factors, all partly responsible, all connected, like a thread of causation, like a sequence or a series of responsibility. Historians approach topics in this way, like, for example, when they ask who was responsible for the Holocaust. Was it a product of Hitler's will, his unique personality? 
Was it more structural? A German soldier in the forest shoots a Jew under orders. He's been told they're the enemy. They want to destroy Germany. It's war. They'll only starve later, etc. Do we intuitively hold the soldier less responsible than Hitler? Do we look at the economic factors that caused the war, the misinformation, the history of anti-Semitism? Many things contribute to a single moment. As the philosopher Robert Kane puts it, to retain individual freedom in a world where we're so clearly determined, we'd have to somehow be the original creators of our own wills. When we can trace most of our behaviour backwards to things that have happened to us in the past, to media exposure, to upbringing, education, conditioning of some kind. But some factors do seem to be more internal than others. If a man has every motivation you could think of, the education, the intelligence, the job market, but still refuses to get off the sofa to find a job out of laziness, then that seems to be an internal cause, that he is the one responsible for that lack of action. This is the big question, the central question. How do we draw that line between internal and external causes. Before we return to Peterson, let's visualise that line. There are interior causes, where we intuitively want to hold someone responsible, and external ones, where responsibility seems to lie elsewhere. But oddly, this line isn't just inside and outside the person, the body. Genes might lie outside the line because it's not in the person's power to change them. If someone is born with a condition that limits their mobility, say, we don't hold them responsible for what they cannot do. But if Lazy Billy has had a good upbringing, is smart, healthy, able-bodied, and there are plenty of jobs available, the responsibility we attribute to him and the moral praise or blame that accompanies it moves within the circle. If there were no jobs in the area, or Billy's mother was unwell and he had to look after her, we might move this factor outside. We might want to blame him less, hold him less morally responsible. Let's take one more historical example. When we ask what caused World War I, what was responsible? The superficial reason we teach to children is that Gavrilo Princip assassinated the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But there were many other factors. Colonial expansion, treaties between countries, nationalism, colonialism. To say Princip was individually responsible for World War I would be ridiculous. Let's return to Jordan Peterson. Okay, so remember, Peterson's central argument is about taking responsibility personally, and it's a theme of the self-help genre more broadly. Set your house in perfect order, he writes, before you criticise the world. And note the perfect here. It's a very absolute choice of word. But again, before we go on, Taking responsibility for your house, for what you can do, is perfectly good advice. Try your hardest and the strategies to do so. Don't be resentful. Set your sights on specific goals. There's some great advice in these books that can strengthen the internal circle. But the question is what's outside the circle? What do we do when there are factors outside of ours and other people's control? Is it not perfectly possible that the organisation of social life, of the state, of our economic systems, of our genetic inheritance, of our educational systems, have effects on individuals that are, shall we say, less than satisfactory? That at least could be improved on? The extent to which Peterson idealises internal factors is illustrated most clearly in Book 1, Rule 3. Make friends with people who want the best for you. In this rule, he warns to think twice before helping someone in need for two main reasons. That you might be helping for the sake of your own ego, and that the person actually doesn't want help. He writes, 
Are you so sure the person crying out to be saved has not decided a thousand times to accept his lot of pointless and worsening suffering? He advises not to assume the person is a noble victim of unjust circumstances and exploitation, and that there is no personal responsibility on the part of the victim. In one passage he asks, how do you know that your attempt to pull someone up won't instead bring them or you further down? He imagines a team of hard-working, brilliant, creative and unified workers who are joined by someone troubled who is performing poorly elsewhere. He says, does the errant interloper immediately straighten up and fly right? No, instead the entire team degenerates. The newcomer remains cynical, arrogant and neurotic. He complains, he shirks, he misses important meetings, his low quality work causes delays and must be redone by others. Not only this, he assuredly declares that the psychological literature is clear on this point, when the single study he's referenced could be interpreted in many ways. Training someone, for example, will always slow you down. Helping someone is always difficult, but there are obvious reasons we do it. Clear justifications for helping someone who might be difficult. It's an odd reference for a clinical psychologist to make. The main problem I have with this is the frankly arrogant and unequivocal choice of language. The psychological literature is clear on this point, he says, yet when you look at the source he's referenced, one study from the 90s, it says this may be because in such teams members who are highly conscientious not only must perform their own tasks but also must perform or redo the tasks of low conscientious members. And the message it supports that runs through the entire chapter is worrying. It's essentially a scepticism at helping people. But of course, imagine if everyone acted in this way, if no one helped anyone. He says in Book 1, Rule 6, Don't blame capitalism, the radical left, or the iniquity of your enemies. Don't reorganise the state until you have ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try to rule a city? Through Peterson's lens, people become atomized, so that responsibility and moral action can only come from within. His account of the self makes people individually accountable and unrealistically self-reliant, so that help must come from within, without any reference to factors that might be too big for a person to overcome themselves. And many have already pointed to how this message falls flat in the context of a long list of historical struggles. Have you thought about looking at your own life, Mandela? Are you sure the British are the problem, Gandhi? Maybe start by cleaning your room. Yes, Dr King, you might want voting rights, but you are a serial adulterer, so... Yes, Mr Patient, you might want this $100,000 life-saving cancer drug, but have you thought about working harder to pay for it first? You really can't afford it. And yes, the Nazis are coming, but there are plenty of places to hide if you had made the effort to think it through, but... You are lazy, after all. Again, I'm not trying to belittle individual responsibility. You could point to any number of counterexamples where it is applicable. I'm only trying to show where it's not, where it seems to leave something bigger out. The question is not just how do we hold individuals responsible for changing themselves, but how do we arrange social, cultural and economic life in such a way so that individuals are most likely to be able to change themselves? As Peterson himself says, perhaps the game you are playing is somehow rigged, but then he can't avoid the temptation to add perhaps by you, unbeknownst to yourself. So what do we do when we're faced with problems outside that circle? When the game is rigged, when there are no jobs, when the Nazis are closing in, when we're denied our basic human rights? What do we do when something else really is responsible? Well, we look to something bigger.
some things, in a broad sense, are clearly what we might call social, cultural or collective in some way. Language, for example, etiquette, fashion, the news cycle, our political systems, the list goes on. These phenomena seem to transcend the individual. When we think about responsibility within them, they make up what philosopher Manuel Vargas has phrased the social scaffolding of moral responsibility, or the moral architecture. That is, the values and the norms, the cultural and social landscape that changes across cultures and throughout history, the external factors that encourage or discourage certain speech, certain behaviours. Take etiquette, for example. We might hold someone morally responsible for being rude, for saying racist or sexist things, for giving a Nazi salute, for constantly interrupting in a conversation. But the person has to know that the statement or action is considered wrong. They have to understand the social scaffolding of moral responsibility. If they come from another country, for example, we might say that they were unaware. As Peterson himself says, what we deem to be valuable and worthy of attention becomes part of the social contract, part of the rewards and punishments meted out respectively for compliance and non-compliance, part of what continually indicates and reminds, here is what is valued, look at that, perceive that and not something else, pursue that, act towards that end and not some other. In other words, the external factors that motivate us to speak or act in specific ways are culturally and socially situated and determined, and we can be aware or unaware of them and how they affect us and others. Sometimes, though, it's the social and cultural scaffolding itself that some might consider wrong, unethical, and in need of changing. Someone in Germany might not have wanted to give the Nazi salute, even though it was considered the responsible thing to do. A slave might not want to use the phrase, yes master. A woman in Afghanistan might want to vote. Some of these things are clearly social. The acceptability of them, the motivational power of the tyranny of the majority, say, as Mill put it, the external pressures are all larger than any one individual. Language is a great and simple example here. We're of course partly responsible for what we say, but the tools, the structure, the language itself, the grammar, it's a broader social phenomenon. Culture is another great example. Roads and infrastructure, moral norms, etiquette and political systems are others. The central point, if we turn to our internal external circle, is this. Some of the factors that contribute towards how people act are external. They're larger than any one person, and any one person can't affect their change. But they can also be changed. History demonstrates it. The question then is how. Take the campaign for women's suffrage. It was an external factor that women couldn't vote, and so had impediments to living their lives in specific ways. The social scaffolding of moral responsibility expected women to act in specific ways, dress in a certain way, look after the home, not work, not get an education, not drive, not vote. To say a woman was responsible for not being able to advance her career in this context is like saying Gavrilo Princip was responsible for World War I. There are larger structural factors. And of course, when we look to history, those factors, those values, have always been contested. Morality is socially and culturally constituted. And because those factors are often so socially entrenched, there's only one way to overcome them or to change them. Collectively, socially, through networking, campaign building and coalition building, through critique, through, dare I say it, ideology.
Instead of acknowledging this, Peterson writes, it's impossible to fight patriarchy, reduce oppression, promote equality, transform capitalism, save the environment, eliminate competitiveness, reduce government, or to run every organization like a business. Such concepts are simply too low resolution. But for collective action, like the civil rights movement, or even building a community bridge, say, low resolution, at first at least, is necessary. It enables us to come together, to form alliances, to delineate the outlines of the problem, to find a broad agreement that unites a group pursuing a particular goal, despite their disagreements. Not every suffragette agreed on the course of action. Not everyone in the community agrees where the bridge should be or what it should be made out of. Not everyone agrees on social values, on national history, but the low resolution goal in many great social justice movements was clear. To take a large external impediment, bigger than any single person, and to unite into a majority powerful enough to address it. In book two, Rule 4, Peterson recommends that we notice that opportunity lurks where responsibility has been abdicated. Great rule. He advises us to organise what you can see is dangerously disorganised. And he writes, What is the antidote to the suffering and malevolence of life? The highest possible goal. What is the prerequisite to pursuit of the highest possible goal? willingness to adopt the maximum degree of responsibility, and this includes the responsibilities that others disregard or neglect. You might object, why should I shoulder all that burden? It's nothing but sacrifice, hardship and trouble. Does this not contradict his advice to think twice before helping others? Does it not include the highest possible social goals? Does it require forming groups to tackle the dangers and the problems that are too large for any single one of us? The reason Peterson dislikes identity politics, postmodernism, feminism, Marxism and otherisms, he often says, is that it reduces individuals to their group identities. You become defined by your class, gender, race, your social position. As he says here, Here's the postmodern world. It's the Hobbesian nightmare. It's everyone against everyone else, except it's not individuals, it's groups. And you're stuck in your damn group, and it's the only thing about you anyways that's relevant, which is why we might base our hiring on it, for example. And you're oppressed, and even if you don't know it, it's only because you've internalized it, and it's the only thing that's real about you anyways. And I can't talk to you because I'm in my own little silo of privileged belief, and Besides, we can't use logic because that doesn't exist, and so you're in a group and I'm in a group, and all we can do is have a war. But this is a perfect example of a straw man. It's cheap and easy to portray a position as ridiculous if you uncharitably twist and simplify it. I don't know anyone that makes an argument like this, and there are never any citations when claims like this are made. What postmodern academics like Judith Butler or Michel Foucault, for example, have argued is that, to a variable extent, people are the product of their cultural, social and economic contexts that they're born into, and that, in many cases, this contributes towards their identities and constrains their possibilities. I mean, take the history of black feminism in the US from this critically acclaimed history. It describes how poverty has been integral to the experience of black women, even more so than black men, since slavery because of overlapping pressures. For example, black men not earning a living wage and having shorter lives than white men, which has left black women widowed with no support, a lack of education through deliberate underfunding of black schools, particularly in the south, cultural norms around black women working in agriculture and domestic service, and endemic reluctance to provide aid to black women, not to mention political exclusion, literacy tests at the ballot box, and more obvious racial discrimination. 
Is it not reasonable to suggest that this had an overwhelming effect on the extent to which black American women could shoulder the type of responsibility Jordan Peterson is advocating for? Does emphasising individual responsibility over identity in this way not encourage a culture of victim blaming? Looking to history for evidence, does it not require something more social and collective to address such endemic injustice? This leads us to next time. Book 2, Rule 6 is Renounce Ideology. In part 2 of this two-part series, I want to look at what ideology is and why we need it to pursue those things that transcend the individual, that make it easier to communicate within groups. We'll see how Peterson's critique of ideology is limited by his partial, one-sided analysis of responsibility, and how a closer look at both draws out even more contradictions in Peterson's worldview. For now, I'll leave you with the words of the man himself. Align yourself, in your soul, with truth and the highest good. There is habitable order to establish, and beauty to bring into existence. There is evil to overcome, suffering to ameliorate, and yourself to better. Make sure you tune in next week for the second part in this series. Uh, it will be just two parts, um, but they do fit together. They come as a pair. You won't have to have watched this one, but I guess you're here, so you have now. And I hope together uh, they make up a cohesive argument against Jordan Peterson's philosophy. And I've tried to make this as fair-handed as possible to encourage just some critical thinking and some skepticism and to consider the other side of the argument if you're a fan of Jordan Peterson. So please do let me know what you think in the comments, where I've been uncharitable maybe, or where you disagree, what I've missed out. Of course, this video wouldn't be possible without all these wonderful Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. If you'd like to support then and now, you can do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar through the link in the description below. Uh, if you can't afford that, just leave a comment press like um, or just watch the videos to the end even if you leave them running while doing the ironing i don't know it helps the algorithm most of all thanks for watching i'll see you next time